Thank you for joining us to discuss Fubo right. TV's fourth quarter Liz. and full year 2020. Fubo. With me today is David Gandler, CEO and co-founder of Fubo, and Simone Nardi, CFO of Fubo. Before we begin, let me quickly review the format of today's presentation. David is going to start with some brief remarks on the quarter and Fubo strategy, and Simone will cover the financials and guidance. Then I'm going to turn the call over to the analysts to dig into Q&A. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this call may contain forward-looking statements, including statements about revenue, non-GAAP net loss and adjusted EBITDA, subscribers, recent acquisitions, development of a wagering offering, and other non-historical statements as further described in our press release. These forward-looking statements are subject to certain risks, uncertainties, and assumptions, including those related to FUBO's growth, evolution of our industry, product development and success, our ability to realize the anticipated benefits of recent acquisitions, our access to capital and fundraising prospects to fund our ongoing operations, our ability to capitalize on market trends and develop and market a wagering offering, and general economic and business conditions, such as effects of industry market, economic, political, or regulatory conditions, future exchange and interest rates, and changes in taxes and other laws, regulations, rates, and policies, including the impact of COVID-19 on the broader market. These statements reflect our current expectations based on our beliefs, assumptions, and information currently available to us. Although we believe these expectations are reasonable, we undertake no obligation to revise any statements to reflect changes that occur after this call. Description of these and other risks that could cause actual results to differ materially from these forward-looking statements are discussed in our reports filed with the SEC, including our most recent quarterly and annual reports and our press release that was issued this afternoon. During the call, we also referred in certain non-GAAP financial measures. These non-GAAP measures should be considered in addition to and not as a substitute for or in isolation from our GAAP results. Reconciliations with the most comparable gap measures are also available in the press release, which is available at ir.fubo.tv. With that, I'll turn it over to David. Thank you, Brinley, and thank you all for joining us today. I am very excited to present to you our Q4 and full year 2020 results. The company has exceeded previously raised guidance with solid growth in revenue, subscription, and viewership. Our mission is to provide the world's most thrilling, sports-first live TV experience with the greatest breadth of premium content, interactivity, and wagering. We believe Fubo sits firmly at the intersection of three megatrends. The secular decline of traditional television, the shift of TV ad dollars to connected devices, and online sports wagering, a market opportunity we believe to be complementary to our sports-first live TV streaming platform. Fourth quarter revenues were up 98% year over year, exceeding for the first time $100 million of quarterly revenue. For those who are new to Fubo TV, <clears throat> top line revenue consists of two primary revenue streams. Subscription revenue, which was up 91% year over year, from $47.9 million to $91.4 million. And advertising revenue, <clears throat> which was up 157% year over year from $5.1 million to $13.1 million. Paid subscribers at quarter end totaled 547,880, and that's an increase of 73% year over year. Given our sports first differentiated position, we experienced continued momentum from the start of the fall sports calendar, that was back in Q3, and throughout Q4, adding an impressive 92,800 net additions in the fourth quarter, and that's up 237% from the prior year. Sports draws premium audiences, and advertisers are increasingly coming to us to reach highly engaged viewers. For the full year, advertising revenue grew to represent 11% of total revenues, compared to 8% in the prior year, helping to contribute to a record adjusted contribution margin of 11.7% in the fourth quarter. And that's up 1,100 basis points from the prior year. We believe our sports-focused market position will help to further grow our business, and our KPIs continue to improve. In 2020, average revenue per user per month increased 17% year over year to $62.84. And annualized ARPU increased by $109 to $754 per customer per year. And within that annualized ARPU of $754, we grew advertising ARPU to $81.76 per customer per year. And that's an increase of 54% year over year, largely driven by an increase in per user engagement and investments in our advertising operations. Our customers continue to be our number one focus, and we continue to invest in our proprietary data to surface relevant content for our subscribers, driving engagement and retention. 
our customers streamed over half a billion hours in 2020. That's an 82% increase year over year. Equally noteworthy, customers streamed an average of 7.2 hours of Fubo per day, indicating that we own significant timeshare in households. Over the long term, we believe this level of daily engagement will provide numerous opportunities for us to further expand monetization on the platform. We continue to invest in our product and into expanding access to more streaming devices such as Samsung TV and Xbox. In fact, churn improved 56 basis points year over year in the fourth quarter. And for the full year, churn improved over 200 basis points over the prior year. Only one quarter ago, I announced our intent to expand Fubo into the online sports wagering market. And I am very pleased to finally report that we have officially closed our acquisition of sports betting and interactive gaming company, Victory. This acquisition enables us to accelerate the launch of our owned and operated sports betting platform called Fubo Sportsbook. We've secured our first market access deal for our sportsbook in Iowa through Casino Queen. And in connection with our launch in Iowa, we are also excited to announce agreements with Major League Baseball and the NBA to become authorized gaming operators for each league. These agreements will provide access to official data and the rights to MLB and NBA league marks and logos within the Fubo Sports app once it's rolled out. In addition to our sportsbook, free-to-play predictive games mark the beginning of Fubo's innovative gaming roadmap. We believe it will enhance the sports streaming experience while also providing a bridge between our video product and our sportsbook. And we expect the integration of gaming with our expansive live sports coverage will create a flywheel that improves engagement and retention and consequently drives advertising revenue. In the third quarter of 2021, we plan to launch free gaming, first to Fubo TV subscribers and then later to all consumers. And in the fourth quarter of this year, we expect to launch the Fubo Sportsbook. We don't see wagering simply as an add-on product to Fubo TV. Instead, we believe there are significant synergies between streaming consumers who enjoy wagering and wagering customers who enjoy streaming live sports. So in 2021 and beyond, we are laser focused on bringing to life our vision of a streaming platform that transcends the industry's current virtual MVPD model and experience. In conclusion, we are very proud of our 2020 results. And as you've seen from our shareholder letter, we are raising our 2021 guidance we laid out for you last quarter. The team is focused on delivering the best streaming experience to our customers, which will drive top line growth and the power of our model will enable us to further our progress on our path to profitability. In 2021, we will continue to expand the breadth of our sports programming while introducing interactivity and wagering to further differentiate our service in the marketplace. And now I'll pass it over to Simone to discuss our 2020 financial highlights and guidance for 2021. Simone? Thank you, David, and good evening, everyone. Our strong performance in the fourth quarter exceeded our outlook and kept off a great year for Fubo. We executed well and delivered record results. Before taking your questions, I will walk you through a few financial highlights and discuss our guidance for 2021. In the fourth quarter, we grew total revenue to $105 million, an increase of 98% year over year compared to Fubo TV pre-merger. This growth was driven by continuous strength in both subscription revenue, which increased 91%, and advertising revenue, which increased 157%, and accounted for 12.4% of total revenue in the quarter. Revenue for the full year was $269 million on a performa combined basis or 261.5 million, excluding Facebook AG, an increase of 78% compared to Fubo TV's pre-merger 2019. Subscription revenue increased 73%, and advertising revenue was up 133%, accounting for 11% of total revenue in 2020. We continue to focus on both the top-line revenue growth as well as ad advancing on our path to strong, sustainable, sustainable margin in the long term. On a full year basis, we reported a 10.1% positive adjusted contribution margin, up from negative 3.1% in 2019. We believe that over the long term, we're well positioned to continue to drive year over year expansion. After our successful registered public offering in October 2020, 
and at least into the NYC, we further strengthen our balance sheet in February with the issuance of $402.5 million of senior convertible notes. With this strong balance sheet, we plan to accelerate the investment in our team and further build our product development to continue to position the company for long-term growth. More broadly, in 2021, we will continue to fo be focused on investing in and executing on our growth strategies, which include growing our subscriber base, increasing advertising revenues, and expanding into sports wagering. Moving to our guidance, after our strong uh, performance in 2020, we are excited about our outlook for 2021. Although we are very optimistic for what is in store for our future wagering business, our guidance does not include any potential wagering revenue at this point in time. Also, a comparison of guidance to prior real we refer to the combined pro forma Fubo TV FaceBank 2020 numbers, excluding FaceBank AG, a business that we sold last year. For the first quarter of 2021, we expect revenue between $101 and $103 million. This represents a growth of 100% year-over-year at the midpoint of the range and reflects the typical seasonality between Q4 and Q1. Historically, Q1 has been softer than Q4 when viewed sequentially on revenue as well as contribution margin. Similarly, we're guiding to Q1 end of the period subscribers of 520 to 530,000. This represents growth of 82% year-over-year at the midpoint. For the full year, we're guiding to year-end subscribers of 760 to 770,000, an increase of 40% year-over-year at the midpoint of the range we provided. This strong subscriber growth, combined with increasing expansion in advertising revenue, give us confidence to increase our 2021 revenue guidance to 460 to $470 million, up over 75% year-over-year. This is up also from our previous, gui previous guidance of $415 to $435 million. In conclusion, we are very excited about our growth opportunities and remain focused on driving long-term expansion and profitability. Brinley will now open it up for questions. Thank you, Simone. At this time, we're going to turn the call over to our analysts for a Q&A session. Please try to limit yourself to two questions so we have enough time for everybody to participate. Our first question comes from Laura Martin of Needham. Laura, please go ahead. Hi there. Great quarter, you guys, and great outlook. Let's start with um, gaming and talk about the question I get most often from investors. The shareholder letter says that ultimately you want to integrate uh, wagering into Fubo's live TV product. My question is, after you work out the bugs of integrating into Fubo, are you willing to license this tech to other, either use it as a negotiating leverage to get content at a cheaper price from people like Comcast who could use it in their book of business, or actually license it to people like Charter that's sort of a big bundle and I don't really view as a competitor to virtual MVPD? Uh, well, thank you, Laura. Uh, great question. Um, and we do get this question often as well. Um, you know, from our perspective right now, we're very focused on our direct-to-consumer business. And we're trying to build a service that allows us to take advantage of the synergies uh, on both the video and on the wagering side. Uh, and at the moment, you know, we're building a team that is really focused on adapting to the current video product. And so for the foreseeable future, we'll probably focus on our direct-to-consumer business. But I don't want to close the door to potential opportunities to work with other you know, MVPDs. Could you, one of the use of proceeds from our October IPO was the fact that you were going to hire a lot of salesmen um, to try to get the CPM up from $20, which is like the programmatic CTV right. cost per thousand to 30. Could you talk about your progress there and where you think you'll end the year in terms of cost per thousand for advertising? Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, first of all, we've done a uh, tremendous job very quickly building up our advertising capabilities from Q3 uh, through Q4. <laughs> Um, and as you saw from the uh, shareholder letter, we finished uh, the year with $8 and roughly 50 cents uh, of ad ARPU, well above uh, what we did even in the third quarter. As you recall, political took up about 15% uh, of that revenue, so we're able to replace that quite, quite nicely. Uh, we continue to hire uh, on the direct side and building up our sponsorship capabilities, but at the moment we're still focused on programmatic. What's interesting about that is we have significant upside. If you think about our CPMs are still in the sort of $20 to $22 range, uh, which gives us, again, enormous upside. We've really been focused on fill, um, and just given the engagement levels that we're seeing, we're starting to see actually more inventory 
which is helping us you know, take our time building out our team. Thanks very much. Great quarter, you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Our next question comes from Kevin Rippey of Evercore. Kevin, nice to see you. Oh, thanks for taking the question, guys. Um, I guess my main one is, as it relates to the revenue guidance you guys lay out for next year, can you give us maybe a little bit more granularity about your expectation for uh, you know, subscription ARPU relative to, to advertising? Do you, you want me to start? Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, so Kevin, first of all, thank you for that. I think um, you know, the way you should think about 21 is similar to the way we finished uh, 2020. If you look at our subscriber growth, subscriber ARPU grew at about 13% and advertising ARPU grew at 52%. Given the strength in the advertising business coupled with you know, uh, advertisers' desire to uh, access connected devices, uh, and then layered on top of that, addressability, we're very confident that we'll continue to grow our advertising revenue well ahead of our subscription revenue on a per user basis. Yeah. Just to add on top of what David just mentioned, I mean, we closed 2019 with re advertising revenue roughly at 8% of total revenue. 2020, we increased that to 11%, and we definitely see advertising to become a more prominent part of our business in the longer term. Yeah, the, the tailwinds are very strong right now. Got it. Thanks. And then just on the, uh, the subscriber growth guidance you guys have given, can you give maybe a little granularity about expectations around gross addition relative to further churn improvements? Yeah, so we've seen, uh, you know, as you see in our guidance, we're projecting uh, in Q1 a little of the seasonality kicking in and kind of bringing us uh, less, uh, a little, you know, flat or a little down compared to Q4 2020. Uh, this is a much lower reduction that we experienced last year, and we continue to assess opportunity to kind of increase uh, this number and look at you know, uh, how to mitigate this seasonality. On the longer term, we're still projecting a strong growth in our subscribers that we've seen. Uh, and as you know, we're laser focused on uh, addressing opportunities to uh, drive efficiently uh, the marketing push to uh, return subscriber growth that allow us to kind of you know, deliver uh, improved results. Yeah, just to add to that, Kevin, um, you know, 2019, uh, the slope at which we deteriorated from Q4 uh, uh, to, to Q1 was roughly about 9%. And this year we are projecting to be about 4% below Q4. And that was a very strong uh, fourth quarter. So we're very happy about the, uh, you know, the early uh, trends in, in January. Obviously, we don't have, we're, not, we're not done with the quarter yet. But, you know, Momentum was strong, we feel very good, and that uh, allowed us to sort of uh, you know, take up our guidance a little bit. Great, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Our next question comes from Jason Helstein of Oppenheimer. Jason, go ahead. Thanks, um, I'll ask you first on um, the, the video, uh, maybe help us a little bit how you're thinking about 2022 non-GAAP contribution profit maybe just uh, perhaps in a margin range. Um, and then second, I think I will recently end it in-person uh, registration around uh, uh, online sports betting. Um, how does that impact your outlook and does it allow you to get to market faster? Thanks. So in terms of the adjusted contribution margin, uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, adjusted contribution margin, uh, we don't provide guidance at this point about these metrics, but you know, we're clearly very focused on uh, expanding our business, uh, focusing on growth uh, with an eye you know, to ensure that you know, we continue to improve you know, in our path to profitability, delivering an year-over-year -year improvement of our margins. So our sequentiality can you know, change given to the seasonality. On a year-over-year -year basis, we continue to grow the business uh, and return more value to the shareholder. Knowing, though, however, that you know, between wagering and potentially other alternative, uh, other acceleration opportunities, uh, we may decide to invest further and, and uh, more quickly you know, in, uh, in the next few quarters to accelerate the future growth. And then on the Iowa question. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, Jason, I couldn't hear that second, the second part of your question. Oh, sure. So Iowa recently ended in-person um, registration for online gaming. Um, and which would make it easier to build a business there. So just talk about how does that impact your outlook and do you think you can kind of come to market there maybe sooner now that that policy changed? Yeah, so uh, you know, obviously I'm not prepared to comment on policy. I will say that we have um, you know, embraced regulation. We've already taken a few calls and um, 
you know, we're, again, very excited about the space. We're very excited about our acquisition of Victory and, you know, Scott Butera and Sam Ratner joining our team. Uh, and so, you know, we've been very focused on, on, on figuring out what are the areas in which we want to focus. And I, what I can say is what I found to be really compelling is the number of crossover synergies that I didn't even realize particularly around incentives, which is an area that we're going to be very focused on. Um, you know, right now our goal is to you know, potentially get to you know, between one and three markets before the end of this year. But you know, based on what we're seeing and sort of the interest levels from some of the potential partners uh, and some of the uh, commentary that we've received from regulators, you know, we feel really good about the space. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Our next question comes from Dan Salmon of BMO. Dan, go ahead, please. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, maybe just follow up on the questions about the improvement in churn and just more directly ask, uh, you know, what would you count as your top two to three contributors to the improvement in churn? Everything from a improved lineup to focusing on, you know, higher value customers, uh, you know, where, where are you seeing the levers really help drive that uh, improvement? And then just the second, uh, on the advertising side, my question is, uh, do you expect to launch a uh, self-serve ad platform in 2021? And uh, where does that stand on your list of product roadmaps uh, for the advertising business? Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. Uh, those are some very good questions. Um, on engagement, you know, I have to say the team has done a phenomenal job in Q4, really attracting subscribers that are high value, that are very sticky. You know, when we look across our engagement metrics, we see increased viewership, you know, 127 hours. Uh, we also see in increased number of uh, daily active users. Uh, we've seen an increase in the number of programs people are watching on average in 2020. We've gotten to 154. Uh, programs per customer. So we feel very good about the types of customers we're attracting. We feel good about the bundles that we're selling, which you know, are, uh, have much higher attachment rates. Attachment rates um, you know, have increased by 3x uh, from the prior year. So that is obviously adding uh, to strong uh, engagement numbers. And what's interesting is when we look at our 12-month retention cohort, we see a very solid lift there. Uh, and that's why we're starting to get really comfortable with our position uh, in the marketplace. And to your second question, if you could just repeat that. We didn't hear that well. Self-serve self -serve yeah. advertising. Where does that stand on the roadmap? Yeah, look, I think that, um, first of all, our advertising revenue is quite strong, uh, even relative to where we were just six months ago. Uh, and, you know, the three things that, the three levers that move our, our ad ARPU per, per customer uh, is really a bit fill rate, number one. Number two is the number of hours that people are watching, which is increasing, and then the CPM. And so when you think about the fact that we've able, we're able to get to $8 and roughly 50 cents per customer, um, you know, we feel that we're not really in a position to focus on a self-serve platform. I think when, once we start to exceed $10, 11 or $12, it probably makes more sense to focus resources in an area where we can maximize our advertising revenue. So we're not there yet, but that's a good thing, of course, because we've got a lot more monetization ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank Our you. next question comes from Darren Afadi from Roth Capital. Go ahead. Uh, hi, David. It's Simone. Congrats hey, on the Darren. quarter. Two questions, if I may. Um, first, you added a fair amount of gross subs in the second half of the year. I'm just kind of curious, two months in, um, how retention of that is looking from that cohort. And then, David, on prior calls, you guys have talked about um, use of AI and being thematic in 2021. I'm kind of curious your plans in using AI in conjunction with all the vast amount of data you have on your sub base to improve results. Thanks. Okay. Uh, why don't I start from, uh, I think the second question was on AI. Um, look, we're very excited about data in general. As you know, we collect about 22 billion data points uh, per month. And we've really invested into our BI team and machine learning. And as you can see from the engagement hours that continue to increase, we, we do a good job surfacing content uh, for our users at the right content at the right time. And so, you know, the, the interesting thing about that is we think we can leverage that data for wagering as well. So we think that there's a lot of areas in which where our video team can support the wagering 
group in really driving a lot of engagement. So we're going to be very focused on machine learning in 2021. Again, we're very happy where we are today. And just some early data points uh, in January. You know, the quarter, at least in January, is looking pretty solid. Um, you know, again, we had a nice sports uh, quarter with uh, college football. Uh, and then, you know, most recently we had the Super Bowl. Um, and so the numbers are there looking strong. And we think we have enough audience to really build some really solid algorithms to really surface the right content. And then over the long haul, surface the right potential betting opportunities as well. So we're thinking about this actually holistically, and we're very excited about it. To the first part of your question, I don't know, somebody, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so the second half of the year for us, that, and as you know, is, uh, is where we get the majority of the staff growth. Uh, we added 262,000 uh, net ads in, uh, in uh, Q3 and Q4 last year as well. Consistently, we invested in marketing to drive this growth. And uh, we actually seen already from the behavior of these new additions that, you know, they're actually quite engaged and uh, they're showing very, you know, promising and interesting um, attachment and engagement to the, to the platform. So quite pleased with that one. Again, clearly, you know, the first half of the year is more of a consolidation phase. You know, and as, as I mentioned before, we're going to work on solutions to kind of improve that situation as well. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Darren. You. Thank you, Darren. Our next question comes from David Beckel of Berenberg. Welcome, David. Hey, they, thanks a lot for the questions. Appreciate yeah. it. Um, How are you, David? Hey, I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, two sort of questions on the on, on the spending side. Appreciate the revenue guidance, of course. Um, but uh, particularly as it relates to 2021, uh, I think you mentioned you'll ex you plan on expanding the breadth of the sports offering. If I heard that correctly, does that imply... Um, the addition of specific types of sports content that you don't currently have? And if so, um, I assume that you expand, you plan to expand uh, the, the top line enough to continue to grow contribution margin. And then um, secondarily, I was hoping you could uh, expand a little bit on, you know, how quickly and in what direction you plan on spending the, the 400 million plus that you just raised and any sort of framework or guidelines you could provide on a rough sort of EBITDA number uh, would be really helpful. So uh, why don't I take the first part of the question uh, around content. Look, our job is to continue to optimize our packaging. So when we say expand this, the breadth of sports, as you recall, in 2020, uh, we decided uh, to work with Disney uh, and allowed our, our Turner deal to expire. So you know, you should think of it as that we're going to be very measured and very disciplined as we have been uh, throughout the year. And that, that goes for everything that we do uh, here at FUBO. But we will be looking for opportunities for us to expand the breadth of content that our current subscribers really enjoy. And on the second. Yeah, that wasn't me. Point. I mean, on a, on a margin basis, uh, David, as you know, we don't provide guidance on the specific metrics at this stage. But, you know, as you've seen in Q4, our subscription related expenses that is, uh, you know, including, you know, our content cost, you know, and mainly represent our content cost was 86 percent of the total revenue, showing the benefits of the strategy of growing advertising, expanding advertising, upselling and expanding our business that way. Um, in reality, that 86% is kind of 90% uh, once cleaned up from some uh, unusual items. Um, now, clearly, um, that is moving in the right direction. Uh, it's not going to be something that's going to be there every quarter consistently, but on the longer term, you know, the uh, disciplined approach on growing advertising and monetization and controlling and optimizing the content offering uh, will help us to kind of continue to deliver you know, improvement uh, over the long term in our margin. Uh, in terms of the adjusted EBITDA, we don't get yet at that level. In terms of our guidance, you know, we'll deliver more when we get close to the to the quarters. Great. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. <clears throat> and our final question comes from Jim Goss of Barrington. Nice to see you, Jim. Nice to see you. <clears throat> uh, so, a couple questions. Um, first, in, in terms of uh, sports wagering, <clears throat> I'm w I was wondering if you need, you feel you need any more acquisitions, or do you feel the current platform and people provide you with the uh, capabilities of, of uh, growing organically uh, now that you have those in place and uh, can, can grow with those? And secondly, <clears throat> Viacom CBS had a, a meeting the other night, as I'm, I'm sure you're aware, and they talked a lot about. Uh, uh, Pluto TV, their AVOD service, and also 
the in incorporation of more live sports in terms of what they plan to be uh, providing in their four, 499 and 999 packages. And I'm wondering if you view those as uh, competitive alternatives and threats that uh, mm -hmm. you, you feel you need to look at as well. Um, thank you, Jim. These are both very important questions. Uh, and, um, you know, on, on question number one, we're very excited about our two acquisitions, Balto Sports and Victory. In fact, the more time that we spend with them, the more excited we are about the talented two groups that we brought together. And uh, we've just uh, closed, as we mentioned uh, in our shareholder letter, um, our acquisition of Victory. You know, next week they'll already be uh, in New York, and we're already meeting with the different uh, teams uh, you know, at FUBO. So um, with respect to potential opportunities, look, uh, you know, we're disciplined, but we're also aggressive. And uh, you know, we were able to pick up two companies that we think are great. And you can tell by how, by how quickly we're moving with deals with, the, uh, with Major League Baseball and the NBA and Iowa, and also getting in front of regulators. So very happy about that. However, we are always in market looking for potential acquisitions that we think will significantly uh, improve our ability to deliver value to our customers. And so we'll continue to do that. Uh, as it relates to your second question uh, around Viacom CBS, there's a lot of players with lots of great offers out there. In fact, this is a wonderful time to be a consumer in America. You get amazing content from dozens and dozens of amazing media companies and new players like the Apples of the world. I don't believe that these companies are a threat to us at all. Fubo TV, very specifically, is a sports first cable TV replacement service. It does not compete with $4 services. It does not compete with $10 services. And if you're a CBS customer and you really love CBS and you don't watch anything else, I would actually urge you to go pick up your CBS Paramount Plus subscription because it is phenomenal content. Um, but if you're looking for a more robust package that includes all the sports that you want with great content from other media companies, then you know, you're probably going to be in the market for a product like ours. And lastly, I would say that there are still 75 million Americans that, that have a MVPD service. And uh, I'm sure you saw the latest uh, Parks Associate report, uh, I think that came out in January, where based on their findings, 43% of cable TV households are likely to switch to a virtual MVPD streaming product. So the market is, is very large. We think that we're going to be very successful in this market, particularly as we combine some of these other capabilities that we've talked about today. Um, but that's it, really. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much, Jim. Appreciate you. Questions. This now concludes the Fubo TV earnings call. We thank you very much for tuning in and look forward to keeping you updated on our progress. Good night. Hey, guys, I'm sitting here. Um, yeah, so something like that. Just a few words <coughs> about what we just heard and some of the your comments that this is a, not a strong earnings call, but a strong sales pitch, right, from Cabaret Z. Uh, I personally think that uh, Fubo uh, has a lot to go behind, uh, behind it. But first, uh, you're asking the same question all over again, like for last, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 uh, live streams. I'm getting asked the same question. Why is Fubo, not Fubo, but why is price dropping? We have so good, so great results. Well, here you go. It's uh, $39 now, so it dropped again. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with the company or with the results. Uh, you don't see this, um, yeah screen share so right now post market is 39 dollars so tomorrow i guess we are going probably to something around 33 and at that case well i would add a lot a lot of shares there because so far what i saw is is really interesting and um well 
If you don't know what FUBU does, again, I have made a video analysis about FUBU and their business uh, model So and f key figures uh, and the team. I think personally that they have a brilliant team with a lot of experience and some of those guys, they received like a best company awards uh, a few years from now before working in FUBU. Uh, they worked in a big companies. I don't remember now right now the company name, but I have this in my video. So feel free to watch it. It's not a long one, but has a ton of information. If you're a FUBU investor long term, I really recommend you're watching it. And also hit that like button and subscribe and also Discord channel. We, I'm waiting for you in there. And uh, well, I guess that's it. I'm going to end up this trans, uh, streaming. Yeah, uh, just reading your comments in here. Yeah, I think in general drop is expected expected even more because, you know, how the market is behaving lately, you know, with all that bond uh, ratio just pump, pump, pumped up, uh, the whole market just crashed at some point. But, well, we will see, you know, and uh, being March and February, just remember last year and the years before, this is not the best time, uh, it, usually it's near to all-time high so i will wait for for big drops to really load up on some of my favorite stocks and again i share my favorite stocks in this channel and also well in the discord channel it's just different ways of sharing things and i again i really appreciate you being here and i just you know i enjoy doing this live streams and just chatting and listen to great companies see you soon investors Bye.